Uh, good evening from Dubai. Uh, good afternoon, Europe, and good morning, America. We are back with another webinar, and this time we are talking metaverse. Metaverse, hype, or hope? That's our topic. The jury is out, and uh, my panelists will help me decide uh, you know, what the future of metaverse is going forward. Uh, let's do the introductions first, and I'll go first. My name is Sharad Agarwal. I'm the Chief Metaverse Officer of CyberGear, an uh, agency that I started 27 years back. In fact, we were the first digital agency in the entire Middle East. And uh, for those of you, uh, at least the Gen Zs in the room, I want to play this clip so they understand how we used to connect to the internet back then. Right, all of you remember this? Right, so back then we used to have something called a modem and we used to have a dial-up modem. It used to connect and drop, bandwidth was limited. Now, of course, everybody watches Netflix with zero buffering, times have changed, but technology has taken 27 years to evolve. So metaverse also needs time. And I think all in the room will agree that uh, given the time, Metaverse is going to blossom and bloom just like the internet. And uh, again, going back memory lane, we used to connect through Netscape, right? You guys remember Netscape? It probably doesn't exist today. We used to search using AltaVista because in my time, there was no Google. Yahoo had come in, but AltaVista somehow was preferred. There was something called Ask Jeeves or Ask.com, which has disappeared. And uh, that was life back then. It was pretty good. My first presentation in life, when I started my agency was top 10 reasons why you should have a website. Top 10 reasons why you should have a website. Now it sounds stupid, but then it was very relevant. Today, my presentation says top 10 reasons why you should pivot to the metaverse. Five years down the road, this will sound stupid, but trust me right now it is relevant. Everybody wants to know how can they benefit from the metaverse. So here we are. That's my introduction. Uh, we have an amazing set of panelists. They are stars in their own right. They are leaders in this industry. And I'm going to go around the room and allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, let me start with Dr. Martha. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Sharad, for having us, in particular me. As you know, I'm super, super passionate about the Metaverse, Web3, and AI. It's all one bit connect. My, and I'm uh, myself uh, not only passionate, but I'm the founder of the Metaverse. So I have... the metaverse uh, obviously it has to have a clear purpose a clear utility i'm advising brands so i'm a web3 advisor and i'm also in, very strong in education i uh, really shape the picture so the i'm the dean and partner of the metaverse academy i'm also a faculty member of fast future fundamentals where we train people to have an interconnective mindset uh, that's the second piece which i feel very important uh, that you understand what the different technologies not only do by themselves in silo, but how it all comes together. And we have seen all the misunderstandings quite recently, I would say a couple of months back when everyone was like, oh, Metaverse is dead because we have AI, because people lost this connection and the interconnectivity of these different topics. So thanks a lot for having me. Super excited now to talk about Metaverse hype or hope. Yeah, thanks, Martha. And thank you for everything that you do every day in educating the market and bringing people up to speed. It's much appreciated and we need cheerleaders from our industry to do just that. So let me bounce to Elisabetta for her introduction, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for having me, uh, Sharad. I'm you know, super happy to be in this panel with amazing uh, professional in the Web3 and the Malware sector. Um, I'm currently CEO and founder of MIAT, uh, which stands for Multiverse Institute for Arts and Technology and board member of Your Immersive. Uh, I have like over 20 years of experience uh, at a global level as a global chief marketing, strategic brand management, innovation and change officers for global corporations like uh, uh, Omnicon Group, Walt Disney, Gucci, the Olympic Games, uh, and also the state of New York. Uh, 
Uh, in sum, MIAT is uh, um, an education and creative hub for uh, immersive arts and emerging technologies, uh, uh, integrating an immersive academy and uh, with hands on and partitioning driven industry access uh, uh, training programs alongside a full service uh, immersive production center generating original immersive experiences also for the Web3 in the metaverse. Uh, we have over 10 years of experience uh, and our heritage in for making production uh, brand marketing is associated with uh, strategy and design thinking approach. And we work uh, with uh, inside MIAT, uh, global award winning uh, immersive art tax, uh, immersive storytellers, VR director, um, Unity and Unreal Engine developers, uh, uh, immersive sound designers, uh, 3D artists, animators, uh, uh, with whom we created bespoke uh, memorable experiences like, uh, you know, uh, 360 filming, uh, uh, augmented reality, uh, six degrees of freedom, uh, uh, virtual experiences, uh, um, animation generative artificial intelligence, uh, immersive art exhibitions for uh, luxury brands all over the world, uh, broadcasters and also digital museums so thank you very much again for having me here today wow i know you have an amazing portfolio of clients as well but we'll get to that in a minute mm -hmm. let's go to spain and talk to alexandra hello um i'm alex um i have a background in uh web 2 marketing and i kind of pivoted to web 3 about like um two years ago and I'm currently um, a Web3 marketing consultant for different brands. Um, and uh, I'm still um, in this space where I'm discovering the tools for the metaverse, like what can be done, what can be done marketing wise. And I'm also bringing forward a lot of uh, founders and marketers that can talk that, that talk about um, anything they do uh, marketing related um, that's related to this new emerging tech um on my podcast um on a weekly basis so uh, a bit of a shorter introduction on my side no awesome uh we'll stay in dubai with me mohammed you are you on you're in dubai yeah so go ahead mohammed hey good evening everybody first of all thank you Sherrod, for this opportunity Hello from Dubai. So I come from a government background. I've worked mainly with prominent entities with starting my career with Dubai Customs, Sports, Dubai Trade. I was with Emirates Airlines for 10 years and I got into the blockchain uh, space uh, roughly three and a half years ago. I co-founded a company called Masari Capital, which focuses on bringing like regulated companies to the region. We are basically partners of Coinify which is one of the world's largest uh, PSP uh, companies. I currently head the region for a metaverse company called Journey. We are one of the most highest award metaverse company where we have worked with clients such as BMW, H&M, Cartier, Vogue, Clinique. Uh, in fact, our Clinique virtual lab is live as well. So, uh, and next year, hopefully, I will finish my master's in AI as well. So obviously uh, my dedication and my commitment to this sector is just uh, insane. I love it. And once again, thank you for everybody for being here. And I hope to share my information and knowledge with you guys. Yeah, thanks, Wama. It's my dream to work for Journey one day. All right. <laughs> well, uh, Samuel is based in Dubai now, used to be in London, but I don't know which part of the world he's coming in from today. Samuel, over to you. Hey, guys. I'm actually in Dubai as well. Um, Hello everyone. So I uh, run a company called LandVault. Um, LandVault is basically a, a metaverse studio and also a metaverse tech company. We build um, tools and products to help big uh, companies from Fortune 500 companies like Mastercard, Walmart, Red Bull, L'Oreal, uh, Standard Chartered, Vivendi, and many more to enter the metaverse. And um, recently, six months ago now, have been moving to Dubai in the region. We have a company here. We have a company now in, in Saudi as well. And we are really doubling down on the region and providing the right tools, the right guidance, the right infrastructure for local companies and governments who are trying to enter the metaverse, or as we call it, the 3D internet. Um, so we're building tools like AI assisted creation tools to build faster. We have a tool to deploy content on the web to make it really easily accessible and also big focus on monetization tools to drive retail investment from your experience through e-commerce or advertising. And those tools are basically deployed on the project that we're doing for the clients. So very excited to be here. Um, big fan of the region. We are hiring locally. We're relocating uh, some of our staff here. And uh, we really see this region as the, the place to be for everything metaverse. I think this is going to become the, the Silicon Valley 
of Web3 and the 3D internet. Um, so very excited to be part of this panel and uh, hopefully share a little bit of knowledge in the next hour. Great. Uh, yeah, so it, uh, Samuel, I think it's a wise move to relocate to Dubai because clearly Dubai is going places. The government has a metaverse strategy. The government has decided on something called GMP, gross metaverse product, instead of GDP. No other uh, city or country in the world has a metaverse strategy just as yet, which is a published document. And the government is very serious on implementing it. Recently, they announced in DIFC a whole city which is being, being built around Web3 and AI. So the whole ecosystem is live, robust, vibrant. So yeah, if uh, you are thinking of uh, you know diversifying or uh, improving your let's say uh, geographic footprint, Dubai certainly has to be on your radar screen. All right, let's get on with the topic on hand: metaverse hype or hope. All right. I, in my opinion, you know, when what do people think about the metaverse depends on who you talk to. There are the optimists like me who say it's going to be huge. And then there are the naysayers who have jumped to write the obituary of the metaverse, just like they did of the internet around 2008. So uh, it is difficult to have one correct answer to this question, but definitely all of us in the room, including the audience can agree that it is early days, right? Technology takes time to evolve. We all agree on that. The Gartner hype cycle calls it the trough of disillusionment because when any new technology comes, people have high expectations, which are not realistic in most cases. And when they are not met, then people you know, express their frustration and they think it's not happening. But mature people who have seen life cycles of technologies, whether it was 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, or perhaps 6G, know that every technology needs time to become mainstream. So my question to the audience, my opening salvo is, what is that one moment or one technology that is going to be, let's say that Eureka moment in the metaverse industry? And I'm gonna go back to Martha for her opinion on what you think is the game changer. You're on mute. I think what we have seen with Apple and Apple Vision Pro launch already gives us a glimpse of how fast it can go because they have done it very smartly. They're not talking about the metaverse. They're not talking about AI. They talk about our spatial computing, virtual realities and augmented realities. And people can relate to this because they know uh, Pokemon Go. So for Apple really to make this, what you say, the smartphone moment, you need a killer app. Yeah. So what they have now is they're using what is already amazing. They're using all the apps. So if you think about the Microsoft Teams suite, it has 345 million users. So the application are huge. The second part, Apple, I mean, Apple does everything. When in the Apple Vision Pro, you can use it as your canvas. So all of a sudden the world becomes comes to canvas that also is something very different from from looking at the metaverse as a separate place we have to stop thinking about it we go there we have to think about it's fully integrated it's basically all the lines between the virtual the augmented the extended reality are all coming together and maybe the current definition of the metaverse we have is a different definition we have in five years so it doesn't really matter it's the most important for me is what does it mean for the different people in society and how it can improve our lives? And we have seen a number of examples already in healthcare. Uh, obviously, we have seen that with the Omniverse, NVIDIA has been able to now have a digital twin of the earth so we can see all the climate changes. We have seen that in education. We see all this beautiful, uh, really, cases developing. And at the same time, we have the technology which has like exponential growth. So no one expected, really, Apple was so quiet as always and never are the first. And now all of a sudden, this thing comes up where everyone agrees we won't run all around with a headset. But it's beautiful because you can see through. It's too expensive. It's too heavy. So you always find, like, think about, uh, you mentioned the internet, but the big phones we had at the beginning that looked like satellite light heavy stones and now it's all different and the phone will go so 
one is the one is really the killer app, but the second part is what will be the wearable. So we we know we don't run around with these heavy glasses, and there is another development, which uh, Sharon, I know you are very well aware of. It's called uh, Human AI Pin. And I think everyone should look at this. This is amazing. It's a, it's a pin here, an AI assistant, an AI coach. It's very natural. And you can do a lot already now with it. There's a brilliant TED talk on, on their website. Uh, you can register. You can uh, eventually get one. The price is not clear, but register, get the news. And it's beautiful. So one for me is a wearable. How do we make sure we interact in this easiness and in this called also killer app but it might not be called killer app. it might be something different but uh it's it's these two things which have to come together and then we have like flooding the genius out of the box like we have seen with chat gdp right absolutely so i kind of agree with you martha that apple has a major role to play also as one of the most profitable companies in the us they have the wherewithal and uh you know the user base so mass adoption can happen through Apple, in my opinion, over time. Right now, uh, the Vision Pro is probably B2B, but once it goes on a B2C version, then I think the mass adoption would happen. So yeah, uh, great that you started us off on this track. Elizabeth, I want to come to you. What do you think is going to lead to mass adoption, which is the low-hanging fruit? On mute, you're on mute. All right. Okay. Well, first of all, um, of course, the metaverse is not dead. Okay. Is alive and, and thriving. I always say that everyone speaks about technology, but I think that it is important to understand that we are in a new anthropological moment where uh, we must create new languages. Uh, um, contents and experiences, because of of course, no, the otherwise the technologies uh, will remain completely empty. Okay, and uh, so what's that is the hype around it, and thank God I have to say in this moment. So uh, another thing that I think is important is to try to understand is that, uh, and we see that every day because we we work with the huge brands and also we teach, you know, at global level. Um, the metaverse, what will be, uh, of course, is like a long term vision, but uh, it will be a convergence of many immersive and emerging technologies. Uh, so, and they go at record speeds. In this moment, we all know that artificial intelligence uh, is the main focus and. Uh, um, but uh, they all will be part of, uh, you know, what uh, Marta just said, the special computing enabling all technologies for the metaverse. So we have to think about uh, the convergence of XR, uh, including uh, for who doesn't know virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, but also, of course, artificial intelligence, but motion capture, volumetric capture, immersive sound, game engines, uh, and holograms. Uh, all these technologies together will really, you know, are necessary to build the new experiences and contents and languages. Uh, AI, I mean, uh, when the uh, the metaverse will be developed, uh, uh, the integration with AI will create what uh, I call meta intelligence, uh, and it will interact with all virtual uh, environments uh, and users, unlocking uh, unprecedented levels of uh, customization and participation. So we also have. Um, um, and, and a strategic partnership with Meta Reality Labs, which is the uh, International Research Center of Meta. Um, they are working on the, the next generation of uh, wearable technology, uh, which will be like uh, these real glasses, uh, you know, uh, having uh, this kind of, uh, you know, device inside uh, with the spatial computing. So, uh, of course, when we will have these, maybe in five, 10 years time, we don't know in this moment exactly, uh, we will get into, you know, the metaverse uh, and uh, it will be like a completely different experiences. And we know that in this moment, in this current moment, we have uh, different kinds of companies coming from different sectors, uh, uh, creating experiences and contents uh, uh, in the metaverse, gaming platforms, and also Web3. Right. Uh, so, yeah, again, I agree with you, Elizabeth. It's, uh, you know, some technology maybe in the wearable side, that will be really disruptive. And uh, that can, again, lead to mass adoption. Talking now of building experiences, uh, immersive experiences, that's what Journey does. So I'm going to bounce to 
Mohammed, to talk to us a little bit about what journey is building. What are the immersive experiences that you guys are toying with? I'm glad you said immersive experiences. We uh, at Journey, we like to actually refer to the metaverse as immersive experiences. Now, uh, why? But first, let me give a small insight about the user behavior, right? Now, today, for example, if you want to go to a restaurant, what, what does the user do today? They, they go on a website, they go on the social media, probably YouTube, check out the pictures. Now, this is a user behavior where they're, they're try, already trying to interact with the brand. Now, immersive experiences are exactly what it sounds like, engaging customers in immersive experiences. Now, I don't know if anybody has actually gone through our Clinique virtual lab. If you haven't, then please do. Now, there's a customer psychology here. Now, take, for example, you're driving down the road and you see a billboard which has the name and or you know the details about the company. And every day you're passing by the road. Now, you come down, for example, to the store and you're like, where have I seen this before? This is subconsciously registering in your mind. Immersive experiences are when you engage customers in such a way they come in, they interact with the brand. On the web, what we do is we, we are a mass, basically metaverse as a service. We there's no download, there's no, uh, you know, you don't need a special computer as what some people think that for Metaverse you need special computing power. Absolutely not. If you can stream a YouTube video, you can enter the Metaverse. It's on the web. That's exactly what we did for Clinique. You enter, you come in, you interact with the brand, you're learning about the brand, learning about the elements that are involved in creating their products. Um, at the same time, what we like to do is we like to create gamification elements. Now, why? Because it encourages users to participate it encourages users to immerse in that experience at the same time the users are learning and at the end of the gamification element you have like what everybody call it a reward like five percent discount for example right so this is now the customer's journey within that experience and at the same time the brand is like able to speak or i would say able to portray its uh, brand image in front of the customer so this is what in short, is immersive experience. And I think that this is, in fact, the future. Moving away from the traditional, what we have had to, you know, up until now, where people think the metaverse is a game or you need to have a Lego-like feeling, it can be anything. It can be just absolutely, you know, just anything that, that you can imagine. Right. Uh, thanks. I know Landwalt is building a lot of immersive experiences for multinational brands. Uh, Samuel, you want to share some success stories? Yeah, definitely. I wanted to touch on the first question that you asked because it was interesting um, when you talked about the, the inflection point and what is going to be really the, the moment where um, the metaverse is, is really going to explode. And I think the, a lot of the, the response were around technology and the device. And it, I think we should clarify that the metaverse is not a device, right? Um, the closest analogy is a, a 3D internet. This is at, at Land Vault, we believe the metaverse is, and we've actually just um, released a big update on our website talking about that. Um, it's uh, it's really born from gaming technologies, the Unity, the Unreal, um, the, these tools that are now becoming mainstream and that having use cases beyond games. So you used to use those tools to build games. Now you can use them to build an e-commerce experience, a showcase of a new hotel, uh, a social network in three dimension. So this is really what is um, powering this shift. It's uh, it's this new technology that is changing the fabric of the internet from HTML and and two two dimensional websites to more immersive websites, more immersive experiences. And I think what's interesting to see here is that technology is already powering a huge industry, which is gaming. And gaming has about three billion people playing games every single day across different devices, from mobile to console, and. Basically, we have proven that with the right content, with the right incentive, people are spending time in those environments. So what the metaverse needs is not a device. It's not a new technology. It's just good, engaging content. And this is basically what Landvolt does. We are basically a, a gaming studio, but instead of building games, we're building uh, experiences for brands and now mainly for governments in the region who are trying to either promote a new hotel, a new um, concert venue, maybe they're trying to promote a whole island, they're trying to promote a new resort. And the vision here is the best way to experience those environments is of course to go there in person. Nothing will ever replace the real world, 
But if you can't go there, if you're too far away, then the second best way to experience it is a 3D immersive experience. It's better than videos, it's better than pictures. So for us, the metaverse represent the next generation. You know, we used to consume a lot of pictures uh, on, on our phones, then now it's mainly video. Basically, the next step is to move to a three-dimensional experience. It's the same gap and it's the same improvement in the user experience. And okay. so that's basically what, what we focus at Landvolt. We, we are building tools to make that possible um, so that anyone is able to create their own experience. One day we believe that when um, the tools are actually scaled, it would be as easy to create your own virtual 3D experience as it is to create your own website, your own blog, or your own Instagram page. That's really the, what we're trying to accelerate through technology. And the first users of that are currently big brands. So for MasterCard, for example, we created a whole uh, event space where for two months they run uh, bi-weekly events with their management team. They brought um, artists as well, and they were inviting partners and creating a, a new way for people to meet in a virtual environment. For banks like Standard Chartered, we created a way for them to um, to acquire talent so it was a, a gamified way to for talent acquisition so um, users that are looking for jobs in the web3 space could answer questions and if they were answering questions they could get to a room and actually apply to to jobs that were not available anywhere else we're working with other banks in the in the area where we are providing more of a training experience so that bank tellers can learn about anti-money laundering and other kinds of uh, risk that they, they can be exposed to. And learning in, in a virtual environment is a lot more immersive and you register information a lot better than if you were just reading questions on a, on a 2D website. So the use cases are very uh, are really varied, um, but these are the use cases that will attract people to spend time in those environments and will eventually propel the, the metaverse to become this new version of the internet. This is not the technology, it's the content that really yeah. is, uh, is the bottleneck right now. Yeah, good point. Uh, once we have good original 3D immersive content, it will uh, lead us in the right direction. I'm going to come to Alexandra. And before that, I want to uh, just let our audience know about a very interesting use case that Emirates Airlines is building as we speak for training 4,000 crew members in the metaverse. Today, uh, you know, if they hire people, they have to come to Dubai, stay here, train in a classroom environment cost a lot of time, money, effort. Once they train in the metaverse, they can be wherever they are in the world. And as you know, Emirates uh, hires people from 70 plus countries from five continents. So that's an excellent use case. And I'm sure all airlines will follow just a matter of time. I'm gonna bounce to Alexandra. Alexandra, talk to us about the importance of education in mass adoption. There's too much jargon being used. Metaverse itself is a jargon in my opinion. It's so hard to explain metaverse to people. So what do you think? What, we should cut through the chase and explain in very simple English to people what NFTs are, what tokenization is, what DAOs are, et cetera, et cetera. Over to you. So I'm actually very happy that you asked this because I feel like uh, the other speakers have a bit of a more corporate experience or working with lots bigger companies. Whereas in my case and everything that I've done in the last 10 years was to work with like early stage startups or um, or as a content creator myself, so I, I can I think I see things from a slightly different perspective. And the first thing I wanted to say here was the fact that I think we should not maybe call it the metaverse because I think this is a very scary word. Um, I just came back from Paris from uh, ETC, and nobody was talking about it. I think um, everybody's trying to get to mass adoption through a way or another, but I think people are trying to build um, solutions that are more appealing to, to the masses, let's say, instead of just uh, going for the people that either have been early adopters or that have been playing games for before um, or actually believe in the technology. So this is something that I really wanted to, uh, to point out from the beginning because I think Web3 in general, for example, was very scary. The metaverse, I think it's even further down the line a bit scarier. Um, so I think a lot of 
big companies have already adopted that for like different purposes, which um, as my colleagues have already said, it, it makes total sense. Uh, but like for the normal people, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna take a little bit um, uh, of education in this sense. So I wanted to um, also point out the fact that in my opinion, education is a very big, very big part of adoption in general, Web3, the metaverse, um, or the emerging technologies, if this is how you want, how you want to call it. And I think um, I've seen a lot of use cases of companies, maybe not use cases, but companies that are that are developing all kinds of educational programs for um, uh, engineers, for example, or uh, the medical staff, um, all kinds of like generally um, general medicine or dentistry. There's actually a company in the Netherlands um, that, that is working towards that. There's also a very big uh, conference in Dubai, if I'm not mis mistaken. In regards to that, so I think these kinds of solutions are going to be one of the drivers of the mass adoption. Um, and instead of um, teaching people about the metaverse, like how to use that, I think like just kind of pushing them uh, into this direction uh, and make it easier for them to, to interact with it. I think that's going to be one of the most important uh, things for to reach out to pretty much everybody or to help everybody understand it a bit better instead of like breaking it down into like smaller concepts. Um, and something else I also wanted to mention was the fact that I think content creators will be one of the biggest drivers that will um, push these technologies for mass adoption. And why I'm saying this is because um, I think they are the ones that have been um, adopting all kinds of tech from the beginning, and they already build big audiences and people, those people trust them. So it really depends on, uh, it doesn't, I don't think it really depends on the kind of content that you do. I think it really depends on like if the creator wants to adopt it and push their audience into this or have them this uh, have some sort of experiences with them. Um, an example of that is I have a friend in, in Madrid, for example, in Spain, and he does uh, a podcast in the metaverse. Um, I think it's called uh, Meta Charlas. And basically um, he brings, brings people, um, um, like guests, they have a chat in the metaverse, like a podcast recording. And basically anybody that is getting uh, that is coming to listen to the episode, they can like walk around and um, uh, this isn't a this could be like an extremely useful tool um, to for any kind of brand to kind of partner up with this kind of creators and to to create some sort of um, experience for them. So I think uh, this is kind of my perspective when it comes to the education side of things and also to like how we can maybe reach to to more people. But uh, obviously, as you said at the beginning, it's it's still a long way to go. Yes. Um, thank you, Alexandra, for those insights. I want to share my experience a little bit on what I've been up to recently. Uh, rather earlier this month, I was on uh, Twitter spaces uh, doing a session with a friend in New York. We had some, I guess, 200 plus people uh, in the room. And uh, I remember asking people to raise their hand if they were from the Web3 industry or interested in Web3. Almost 80% plus raised their hand. Then I asked people, how many of you are actually making money in Web3? And honest, two people raised their hands. And when I requested them to come to the mic, they didn't show up. I don't know if they were shy or they were hesitant, but this was an eye opener. I talked to so many people almost on a daily basis and they are super busy. Super busy, back to back Zoom meetings, right? They say, Sharad, if you don't mind, can we do next week? I'm like, okay, cool, next week. But how many of these people are actually profiting from Web3? This is, in my opinion, the real question, which is not being asked. I'm not going to embarrass anybody in the panel or in the audience by asking this question. But I think we need to discuss this uh, openly. And I would like all the panelists to share uh, their opinion on where is the ROI in the metaverse? Where is the ROE, as I call return on engagement? What happens first? And do people just keep building, hoping that they will come? I'm going to float this to all, starting with Martha. 
you are you are on mute. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sharad. Uh, just uh, just two minutes on what has been discussed before, because what I obviously love and we always talk about it are these experiences we which come first. Like Steve Jobs said, you have to focus focus on experiences and then you work backwards to technology. So when we are talking about technology is really a, a tool to get to those experiences. Like if we have the smartphone, if we don't have the smartphone, we don't get to the experience. But in the first, what we look at is the experience. And also what our Samuel said is, is very clear. Mohamed said it, Alexander said it. How do we get people in there? We need education. So also my verse, like the land world was, is a 3D experience. You have easy, easy access with computer, but it's then web too. And I know from my experience, as soon as I had the headset on, I felt like, wow, you know, this is it. And this this is it moment doesn't, I mean, it's already great to have the avatar and to have the experiences with the brand, but this only happens if you are able to educate people and, and do this better. So the second point which you are making, Sharad, who's making money in, in this world, in the Web3 world? Obviously, we have some of the big brands, Nike, or in comparison, is small. They had this 180 million on NFT, mainly royalties through Artifact. For me, this is right now is a big investment. So it's an investment in myself. It's an investment in what I believe in. It's an investment in what I'm passionate about. But it doesn't mean that I have zero because when I work with brands, also those experiences have a value. But we have to also acknowledge a lot of the things are maybe not the same quality and they're all for free. Everything is for free in this space, or a lot. I shouldn't say everything. Uh, if you use some of the as a service, it's not for free. But if you want to really do valuable things, then brands and companies, in my view, also realize it doesn't come for free. I had tons of brands and even universities providing uh, classes, providing experiences. And then uh, people are very disappointed because I said, yeah, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a good experience. And I think this is also a big risk. If you have um, mediocre to not as good experiences, people testing this and they say, I can't see, I can't see where this is going. Whereas well, when we go to more into the professional world, like uh, Alexandra, you have mentioned the virtual training of doctors or even what we see with NVIDIA, what they do with Siemens, with BMW and so on. BMW obviously has the industrial metaverse as well. As you were saying, somehow we have the consumer and they earn tons. I mean, that's why the share price is so high. It's not only because of AI, AI is just part of it. They earn tons of money in there. But for an individual, a content creator, I work with a lot of creative people. I'm in a wonderful community choice or diversity inclusion for ABQ TA plus community. Very, very, very difficult to earn money right now. This is the reality. And as you correctly say, Sharad, we have to think about, but we also have as a community, we have to stick together somehow and say these are our principles this is what we want to achieve what is the prime goal we have uh, so prime goal should be education prime goal should be get more people into this and obviously make money by it because when you do something very good when you are successful success leads success that's my my personal experience and my mm -hmm personal view uh, of of the Web3 world right now. So I'm not surprised that most of the people like, uh, I don't want to talk about that I make money or not. Yeah. So I do think in my, I'm, my banking background is, is corporate. Yes. Uh, over 20 years of financial services. And I was always very fortunate, but I feel myself very fortunate now because I'm in this new transformative journey. And I have never been in such a time before. I was too young for the internet to to really go. I mean, I got it and it was there, but I didn't I didn't shape it. And I think with everyone here today, if we're a part of this and can shape it, how wonderful is that? Absolutely. Well said, Martha. Totally 100% agree with you. I second you. I'm going to bounce to Elizabeth. Same question. Where's the beef? Who's making the money? <laughs> Okay, it was making the money, uh, a few companies for sure. Uh, I don't know about like, uh, you know, people. However, I, you know, I would like to say that, you know, in the web, like web three field, let's call it this way, okay? 
just like the first one as it, like uh, the backbone structure also the metaverse. Uh, we, we see in this moment like a few trends uh, and uh, really like success strategies for brands also to pursue. And the new KPIs, uh, which is very important uh, in this moment are immersive content and experiences, as we said before, engagement, social currency, access, utility, and scarcity. And these are the elements that will increase over the overall value and appeal of these initiatives. Um, you know, the, the main trends that we are seeing in this moment at really global level are um, developing digital collectibles and multi-utility NFTs. Okay, these are actually enriching brand engagement and revenues uh, of companies delivering digital experiences, you know, more than digital and uh, so physical and uh, digital. Uh, last year, we have created for Bulgari is one of our like a client and a luxury um, in our sector, uh, the first high end uh, uh, jewelry NFT capsule uh, representing two in real life necklaces and one digital now part of the Bulgari heritage. And who buys the necklaces? Uh, receives the NFT and our digital artwork at home. You know, one of the first one that has been sold for 6 million um, euro. Um, and, you know, another one like design, another trend is like designing application for the music sector, which is something very important. And now, you know, what's happening is like, you know, brands are um, working as a record level, which is very particular, very peculiar. Uh, an example in this field is like a Bacardi. I'm not, and I don't know if you're aware of that, but Bacardi has created like an NFT collection uh, going also on the metaverse for to support women uh, in the music sector. But they also have created a new business model, which means that uh, those, I mean, the fund who buy the NFT have receive a monetary remuneration in return. So this is a new complete business model. And in the web three for good, this is like another trend that we were seeing um, before, like we uh, was mentioned clinic, uh, actually is driving accessibility and inclusivity in the web three sector. Another example, apart from clinic, who did an amazing job, I, I think, is Lacoste. Lacoste Foundation, uh, together with uh, um, Sport dans la Ville, it's uh, um, another like, uh, you know, sport foundation created, a design uh, a competition involving Minecraft gamers uh, and uh, uh, to design tennis court then built in real life uh, to promote disadvantaged youth uh, personal growth. So also the Web3 for good is very, very important as a trend and as a strategy. And one of the most important that we we'll see is the co-creation. Uh, communities are the real driving force behind the uh, Web3. And uh, you know uh, they are actually chained by common values uh, and they wanted to have a direct stake in the brands and projects they love, which means that a loyal audience in this moment is has a direct monetary investment in the brand ecosystem. Are brands ready for that? No, not at all, because they, they, they must be really like they open you know, everything to their community. However, there are likely companies who are doing very well. We all know Nike is very advanced in the sector. You know, with Nike Swoosh, they created their community, over 300,000 people, and they are uh, creating their products with their community. They just launched uh, Air Force One in less than 12 days and made like over $1.3 million in revenue. And maybe the last one, is the last trend that we see is the, you know, delivering digital experiences, whether it's in the metaverse, or uh, Web3 is always very important to mix the two things together. There are metaverse platforms like the Nemesis uh, also is a very interesting metaverse platform. So, and uh, they are creating these experiences, mixing like uh, the digital with uh, the physical. And also that it does, we all know that they are like, uh, have a massive adoption of Web3 in the metaverse. Uh, they are generating uh, with the digital uh, experiences over in the secondary market over 100 and 75 million dollars of revenue. So I would say that uh, there's someone who's making the money. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many other people. Uh, and, but the keywords here are, you know, interactivity, uh, digital co-creation, 3D, transmedia, immersive storytelling, uh, and of course, uh, the next uh, interoperability when it will be. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, answer. You have given us a lot of brands who are, I think, succeeding in a big way. It's early days, like we all agreed. Uh, you know, you might have caught this recently. The Nike CEO famously said, we are now a technology company. Something to think about. And I think every company on the planet will sooner than later 
be a software company. With the advent of generative AI, mark my words, every single company will be investing in AI. And it's a smart thing to do. And uh, not something for the future. This is something for now. So think about it. Okay, Samuel, uh, I want to come to you because you've been raising a lot of money. I know that from the market. Is it drying up? Is it going towards AI? What, what is the current scenario? Please update us. Yeah, I think we are a great example of um, a company that has really benefited from, from the hype last year. Um, you know, we, we were, uh, we're a five-year-old company initially in the gaming space. We have helped brands, top brands enter video games through product placement and sponsorship before. And last year we saw an opportunity to broaden that up. And instead of just limiting us to games, which is obviously already huge, now actually helping those brands um, and uh, other types of clients enter the metaverse, the 3D internet. Um, and over the years, we've raised about $40 million in uh, various rounds from, from venture capital, and that enabled us to scale the team. We have over 120 people full-time right now, but also weather the storm, because obviously last year, every single brand from every type of verticals was literally throwing money at us to, to build the experience. We managed to build a, a reputation really early on and really be seen as that go-to partner for everyone that wanted to build on platforms like Sandbox, Decentraland, and, and now Roblox and so on. And what we found is the, a lot of the motivation to enter those platforms were obviously driven by being the first uh, hype being, you know, free free PR was basically the metric that a lot of those companies were looking at. Even if you ask Adidas, who made something like, um, you know, $18 million selling their NFT, they got, I think, about $90 million worth of uh, earned media, free free press at the, at, the, at the back of that. And that was the real success KPI. So it was all about press. Now the press doesn't really talk about brands entering the metaverse because dozens of them have done it. And obviously it's it's less of a news factor. So the era of hype is basically gone, which in a way is great because we can now focus on the era of, of utility. And so we really looked at what are the core fundamentals that still hold true today? What are the things that those clients want to do uh, and that the metaverse can, can solve for them? And we found that high fidelity experiences to engage clients, things that you can measure, the ability to drive return on investments, those were things that were we're still going to be true. And this is what we are we are doubling down. So I think if you look at on a macro level, of course, a lot of metaverse companies are failing. Um, but you know, most of them did not really deliver a lot of value. And of course, now they're not getting funded because the market is, I guess, back to a back to a, a normal market, more reasonable market. But I do believe that the companies that are building true technology that is going to be transformative. Um, are still going to get funded. So it's really, you know, narrowing down on the good companies, the one that are truly building a business. There's a much bigger focus on fundamentals, stuff like profit, for example, making money. Um, and I think overall, it's, uh, it's a really good thing. Um, it's, it happens on, you know, crypto as well. In 2017, uh, every project was getting funded. Now it's a lot more difficult, but if you have a, a strong use case, and you can show that you can you know, build a strong treasury, your project still gets funded. So there's that hype curve for every new project, every new technology, sorry. And uh, the metaverse has ju just been through it. But the key to remember is that the fundamentals that are driving this, which is gaming technologies on one side and the blockchain to some extent that will become the new financial backbone of the metaverse. Those are huge trends that are not stopping. And the convergence is this 3D internet, this metaverse. So the fundamentals have never been stronger. Um, but of course, as I said, I think that we're entering a new era, the era of utility and the companies that will get rewarded are the ones that are building actual businesses. Yeah, uh, point well taken. Utility is key. And I think all of us need to focus on that. Uh, we are 52 minutes in our conversation. Uh, they say time flies when you're having fun. Uh, we have to wrap up in eight minutes exactly. So I'm going to very quickly go around the room briefly. Uh, before that, Mohammed, uh, talk to me about 
uh, journey a little bit? I mean, how do you qualify your clients? Who are you after? Is it the government? Is it the private sector? Tell us a little bit about uh, marketing at Journey. Good question. Um, for us, honestly, everyone is a client. We don't really segregate. We work with obviously top brands like BMW, H&M, Cartier, and so on and so forth. But also we work with a lot of government entities. Now, there, I loved how everybody spoke about education, how everybody spoke about the bridge between Web 2 and Web 3. Now, what we have realized is that a lot of people actually don't know what a metaverse is. Right. They don't know what an immersive experience is. So there's always a notion or there's always a need for education to tell them, look, it's not, I'm from this region now, you know, Sharad, from this region, everybody thinks metaverse is a game. OK, metaverse is not a game. OK, um, and obviously we have had instances in the past where we have had metaverses that make the experiences look like a game. Right. Lego like roaming around. But um, that's where we see that we have to educate these people. Now, what we do is we educate our clients by you know, providing consultancy and telling them, listen, you can literally be anything, anyone in the metaverse, but you don't need any special computer, computers. You, don't, you can access it from any device. You can uh, you know, stream as if you're streaming a YouTube channel. So that's when they see the difference and they're like, okay, this is amazing. I mean, we had this different notion where we need to select these avatars. We have to download computers, no. Now, one of the things that happened with, during this educational, I would say, journey is then they would understand that how important it is to engage customers. Now, my question is, put the metaverse aside, put the immersive experience aside. Engaging customers is not new. What is traditional marketing? What is everybody doing up until now? Like, how do you engage customers? Events, promotions, video, social media pr promotions, so on and so forth. So what we have realized is that engaging customer always leads to bottom line revenue growth, right? R right. Now, this is exactly what immersive experience does. Now, let's be honest. We, as humans, we are always naturally inclined to beautiful things. I don't know about anybody else, but I've always wanted to be a Superman. What if you could fly in an immersive experience? What if you could just be from one part of the world to another part of the world? Now, isn't it exciting? Doesn't it just be like, wow, I always wanted to do that. This is exactly what immersive experiences or the metaverse enables, right? So what we have realized is that working with top brands and government entities, we're able to tell this story. We're able to make users feel powerful, make it look beautiful, engage customers. And then hence, obviously I want to be mindful of the time, drive bottom line, bottom line revenue. So this is what immersive experiences is. This is what we do, create, absolutely unparalleled beautiful experiences for everybody to enjoy absolutely yeah agreed 100 percent uh alexander you want to add anything to what has been said on this no i just uh i just really liked what samuel said about the utility part of things which for me is very very important web3 the metaverse as well and i think this is one of the things that is going to appeal to a lot more people. Um, something I speak about with a lot of the speakers on my podcast, for example, especially the ones that are building games, is regarding uh, the fact that like everybody's like, yeah, we're building games, we did this, we did that. But like the majority of time, they all tar most target men. Um, and therefore, I would like to see it a bit broaden where like females are also included and not just the ones that, are, that have already played games, but something that would appeal to to the majority of us as well um and something else i wanted to add like very quickly is regarding the creator economy because i feel like it, it, it has not been touched on a lot um, everybody keeps talking about it but it's still in a, a blurry waters let's say and i think this is one of, one of the things that is going to drive the adoption of of all this emerging tech where people are going to be part of it and they will have like something at stake as well to to kind of drive it uh to share with their friends their family and to, to everybody they know so um yeah just yeah my great. uh thanks for that uh, we have a lot of uh, comments in the chat so i want to thank our audience for uh, being very lively there's one question that perhaps martha can address it's from uh, balas sebok uh, who says uh, he's from the financial services background so how do you see the metaverse for banking finance sector martha you want to take that yeah, very big 
Uh, but it's not so much about like JP Morgan establishing a brand in the metaverse. Uh, I think we got all very bored with that specific example, but it's are on different layers. So one big layer in financial services is certainly payments. So all the gaming or everything is driven by, by payments, payment platforms. That's why JP Morgan also invests a lot in blockchain, in payments. And that's the next big thing. So you can say, then you, what we talked a lot about customer experiences. So South Korea is leading the pack, I would say, also in, in banking. So there are tons of examples how already now there's a big, big engagement in those customer experiences. So I do work a lot with banks and are, they always say, oh, we want to be in decentralized land or want to be there. That's totally irrelevant. It's really about what is the use case or what really you want to do. It comes back to all the basics we have seen before. And one thing which uh, I think is important overall, also so you have kindly provided or uh, uh, your glossary, but we should not forget the best what we can do is like Starbucks. We don't talk about NFTs. We talk about stamps. We don't talk about oh, Apple. We don't talk about all these terms, uh, which are, you know, you can explain them. But as soon as you have to explain to customers, I almost feel you have lost them. So the best we can do to create those experiences without explaining NFTs or anything, it's because they will learn very quickly, wow, I can own this. I can own the painting, like digital art, like you, everyone loves beauty, by the way, because from a neuroscience point of view, uh, it just resonates. It triggers a lot of the different parts in the brain. So banking and beauty is our future. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we are out of time. So I'm going to give 30 seconds to each of our panelists for wrapping it up. Your final comments, please, starting with Elisabetta. Anything that you want to say which we didn't already discuss, now is your chance. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, when we started to create this company, uh, combining education, production, research, people didn't understand why. Okay, um, and uh, you know, I think that Web3 and the metaverse uh, really need a lot of education. We can see it every single day, not only to make people understand what they are and the potential, but also, you know, we train uh, the, the talents of the future, the artists of the future. So all those uh, people, artists, professional, corporates from all over the world uh, to uh, become capable to conceive and produce uh, content uh, experiences uh, with all immersive and emerging uh, uh, technologies. So it's a new anthropological moment. I want to underline that. Uh, contents and the creator economies uh, are the core of these uh, sectors uh, and they need uh, to be in a way Web3 in the metaverse transparent, uh, accountable, which is dramatically important, uh, human-centric. They need to foster authenticity and really, again, the strength in the art text of the future. Perfect. Uh, Mohamed, uh, closing thoughts. First of all, please harness the immersive experiences. Please engage your customers. Thank you very much. Metaverse is not a hype. It is the hope. It is the future. That's all I want to say. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Alexandra. Your closing thoughts. Um, I, all I want to say is that like being first uh, really pays off. I've seen this in Web3 and like sometimes you, you really feel like uh, you're there alone, but actually looking outside your, your bubble, let's say that like you realize there are like a lot of people that know a lot more things than you or like you can with whom you can build with. So I think that would be very important on the, um, on the consumer side of things, let's say. Um, and also uh, power to all the women in, in this panel. <laughs> Uh, I'm very happy that this new tech is bringing more women uh, that um, are, really, are really showing great, great strength. So, um, yeah. Thank Alexandra, you. if I may add to that, at onlywebinars.com, we always have more female panelists than male. And you can check our record. I've hosted 70 plus webinars and 90% of the time this is true. So, Thank you. <laughs> even women power. Hashtag women power. Absolutely. Martha, your closing uh, comments. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I think uh, Mohamed and everyone else also mentioned it. Uh, get involved. Uh, get those experiences. They are uh, all open for you there. Contact us. We all love what we do. We help you. We had a lot of questions. Uh, we love to collaborate, if I may say that, on behalf of everyone. Uh, be brave and uh, be curious and just also be prepared to fail. 
you know, yes. everyone tells. So it, it learn is okay that. to fail. Very important point. It's okay yes, to fail. It's yeah. very important also to fail. Um, I do this uh, more than once. Uh, yeah. And I've done that also in my life. But I always, and you never know where this is leading to. I think also nowadays are, is over where you believe that I will be the CEO. What means a CEO? I, I will believe that. Think about what you really, really want in life and then just do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's end on that note. I want to thank you for the privilege of your time for investing 60 minutes with us, all the panelists, all the audience. On a housekeeping note, our next webinar is in September and we are discussing sustainability. It's over two days, eighth and ninth. Amazing panelists again. Climate change is for real. We all need to do our bit uh, in this space. So we'll be having exhaustive uh, sessions. And then the big one is the Meta Shapers Web3 and AI summit on 4th of October. Please save the date. It's going to be six hours sessions, six hours. There are like 20 presentations, two panels, fireside chats, including meditation. So don't miss that one. And uh, finally, uh, the recording and a podcast of this webinar will be available tomorrow, same time at onlywebinars.com. Please share it with your friends, family, and your uh, larger network, because part of what we do at Only Webinars is educate people on the merits of technology. So final bye. And thank you again, panelists, for being here. And see you on the other side. Bye for now.